Hello and welcome back to the class CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. So on Wednesday uh, of this Monday, Wednesday class, today we are going to dip our feet into the waters of coding. We've been doing lots of art and drawing and that sort of artistry for a while. We started that. We started that back on part one of the class, and then we've continued it in the last week where we had another sort of lessons on art and drawing and the model sheet and such. But a lot of what the class will be moving forward is um, making a game, making an interactive project, and that's gonna require coding. So today, if you look on the syllabus officially, we're gonna start the coding stuff next week, but we're on track very well. So actually we're gonna start a little bit of it today. And then of course, we're gonna continue it on the following weeks. We need to do a little bit more setup than we might be used to just for drawing. We need to do a little bit of setup for a game project. So that's why we're gonna kind of look at it today and on Monday and then moving forward, the sort of setup of things. What we're doing today is not gonna be anything homework related. It's gonna be very valuable and you're gonna to need to make sure you can do this or else the game stuff won't work. So it needs a little bit more setup and I'll guide you through it all, of course. Now, um, on our very first setup here, actually, I'm gonna write some notes. I'm gonna write some notes in a separate document here just to have these also. Uh, and I'll put these on Canvas, of course, but I think it'll be valuable to write some notes because there's, there's gonna be some step-by-step -step stuff that you do need to be able to do very well. You can write your own notes as well, but I'll provide you these notes. And if you're able to do these things as sort of step zero, you will be able to do the future things very well. So to set up a project for a game, we need a few steps. Here in Adobe Animate, I've started up the app. I've signed in as usual. And if I go to new file, file new, I'm gonna ignore these start fast for the moment. I guess presets is the same sort of thing. You go to preset, that's the same thing as clicking on the new on the left or file new at the top. I started to mention previously, there are these other presets that are going to be useful to us. We've been using the character animation full HD so far but that assumes you're creating a project that is only animated and passive. We are going to create an interactive project. So under advanced, that's the first step there. New project and then advanced tab. Then we have two options, Air for iOS and Air for Android. For the purposes of teaching this, I'm gonna go through the Android route. Even though you may have an iPhone, you still want to do this under Android. And they're going to be compatible, of course. Behind the scenes, it's the right um, code and such. It's just that the starting template dimensions and such are a little different. Either of these will work. But for the class, I'm going to be doing the lecture on the Android one. Um, so from here, Air for Android. Now, Air stands for something. It doesn't matter, but it's Adobe Interactive Runtime, I think. Have to look it up. But anyway, this will give us access to the ability to create interactive games. You're going to, on iPhone or an iPad or an Android or a Samsung Galaxy or whatever, you're going to be able to have a game project that is gonna be on the device and actually tap and interact in a real game with either one of these two templates. There's also Air for Desktop, which technically with this, you can make an interactive game project that is on a computer. You can make a full game project for computers with one of these Air templates. Before I can proceed, notice it says Air SDK is no longer shipped with Animate, in order to enable this, please refer to the following link. Okay, this is normal, this is fine. What is happening here is that Animate is such a powerful app, it can do so much, 
but the game stuff is sort of like the highest level of it all and not everyone uses it for that. Therefore, it does not come pre-installed out of the box. We just need to activate it and it's an easy activation, but that's why we have to write some steps here and follow these steps. If you do this on your own home computer, you only have to do it once and it'll remember and it'll work. But on these computers, obviously, because of deep freeze, once you turn off the computer, it forgets everything. So you're gonna have to do this step every time you come into the lab. And it's not so complicated, but it's a few steps. Okay, well, what is this telling us here? Enable Air SDK. If I follow that link, it'll give you some instructions here. You need to download a file. You're gonna unzip the file, and then you're gonna tell Animate, here is the file. And then it's and then it's done. It, it will work. It's an extra step. You don't need to download this. We already have it ready for you. But at home, you are going to need to follow these steps. So I'm going to write these steps. We'll do them together. We have a, oh, we have a three A, which is click the link for Air SDK. It's the extra software that is not activated. And once you activate it once, and it's free, of course, it it's all comes with the package. You just have to do an extra step. But once you follow that enable air, it's gonna take you to the website, download air. Again, don't do this. We already did it for you, but I'm showing this at home. I would follow the link and it says all this great stuff. Okay, very nice. I accept. And then either you get the air um, file for Windows or for Mac or for Linux. You don't need anything here about this flex developers, just ignore that. And if you were at home on your own home computer, well, you would pick the one you need. For example, Windows, I'm not gonna click it, don't click it. Notice it's going to download down at the bottom here. It says it's gonna download a zip file. It's gonna be like 600 megabytes. It'll take a moment to download. Once it downloads, you have to unzip it, right click extract, or on the Mac, it'll automatically unzip. So click the link for the Air SDK, 3B, uh, agree and download zip file, 3C, um, you know, save or, or put the folder somewhere, put it on your desktop, leave it in your downloads folder, put it on the C drive, whatever. Um, already done this for you on these computers. On these computers, on the C drive, it's right there waiting for us, Air SDK. You don't have to waste your time to download it. We've done it for you. At home, you would download the file, you would unzip it, you would put it somewhere so that you can access it. Because this says, download it, unzip it, save it somewhere onto your computer. Download it, extract it, and then in animate, we need to go to the menu. The help menu, manage Adobe Air, add SDK. So Gil, let's follow along here. Can you please do what I'm doing here? Go into Adobe Animate and then follow along, please. So what we're gonna do then here is once we've downloaded this file, we are going to then connect it. That's what this is telling us. This is telling us you, you need to connect this thing. Okay, I'm gonna cancel this. And as the instruction says, help, Help menu, manage Adobe Air SDK. Right, so put the folder somewhere, 3D. Uh, help manage Adobe Air. There's a little plus symbol right here. In our case, it's ready for us to go on the C drive, this PC, Windows C, Air SDK folder, select. Now, if yours says version 501 or whatever version people say, it doesn't matter. Mine says 51012, whatever yours might say, it doesn't matter. Uh, but these steps here, these sub steps, in the lab here, we're going to have to do this every time. 
because these computers forget to the next steps over here. So I've attached the path. I've told it, here's the extra code. Here's the ability for us to unlock even more capabilities. Okay. Now if I go back to new file, and we go back to advanced, and if I select the Air Android, now it doesn't say, hey, this isn't ready. Now it has dimensions. Now it has frame rates. Now it has all that good stuff. So we need to do this every time we come to the lab here. When you do this at home, you only need to do it one time, then it'll remember. But obviously, I'll remind us next time. And then when we go further in the semester, I don't have to remind you. You will know what to do because now we can go to new project, advanced tab, then um, air for Android. Again, if you have an iPhone, just for the class purposes to learn this stuff, uh, select the Android version. Uh, you'll be able to still use your iPhone later. Dimensions for the moment are perfectly fine. Frame rate of 24 is fine. So all the defaults here are fine. I'll click Create. Zoom out as usual. Change my background color as usual, and I'll save. See how it's slightly different than, than just starting a project. So we do need to do a few steps. So um, does that make sense? Put it in the chat. And then here in person, let's take a moment to do this. So let's make sure we all do this because we won't be able to proceed on the lecture unless we do this. Everyone good at home? No questions there at home? Don't have to do it right now. It might take a moment, but people need to do this at some point. The width and the height. Yeah, let's just leave those as the dimensions. Good eye when you open it up and it asks what sizes, just leave those for the moment. The cool thing about working with Animate, as we've talked about before, this is a vector based drawing software, which means that when you make a little shape, um, you can resize it and it still keeps quality. So even if we pick a small size, the width and the height of the units, even if we keep it as a small size, when it gets put onto a big phone, the quality will still be great. When you put it on a big tablet, the quality will still be great. When you put it on a desktop, right? Because one of the options there was create a game for desktop. 
Well, the cool thing is that whatever dimensions it is, it will still look great because Adobe Animate is set up to be high quality on any dimensions. So we were used to the HD size for video, but for the Adobe Air at the moment, uh, these dimensions are perfect. Okay, so I've got this starting point file. For the moment, I'm gonna draw a happy face. Go ahead and draw a happy face or a character or whatever, just on your, there. So this is all about setting up the project. Okay, next, then we've got, um, we'll do here, viewing your project. Have the play button at the top, test movie. But now that we're dealing with a game, we not only are just gonna test our project, we're gonna debug our project. Debugging is the process of checking that our project works properly, that the buttons work, that the sound works, that the, the, the algorithm and the logic and such works, removing the bugs, the errors, because now we're gonna start to deal with code. So this is gonna be debugging. Of all that we've had all along, okay, control, we'll test our project, sure. But now we've got debug. We're gonna spend a lot of time in the debug view instead of the control test. We're gonna do it in the debug section. In the debug section, we have debug movie. Zoom in here. We've got debug movie. Under debug movie, it says, okay, test it as a desktop app or debug it as a desktop app debug it as the mobile simulator or debug it on a USB device. Eventually, definitely next week, maybe today, but next week, we're going to learn about plugging in our device so that we can use our projects and see them right on our devices. I'll do that eventually, maybe not today. But if we don't have a device to plug in, we have these simulators. And it's often going to be a little faster to test your project under the simulator rather than the real device. And as I said, I am going to let you borrow if you want one in my cabinet of wonders over there. I've got uh, a bunch of Android tablets for you to borrow during class because at the moment, since we created an Android project, if you plug in your iPhone, it, it won't connect right away. And so I've got some Android tablets for you to borrow. We're gonna use this debug screen. Let's try this. If we go up to the debug menu, go to debug, go to debug movie, mobile. Okay, so something's about to happen here. This is popping up here, simulator. So we're gonna have like this virtual device that is gonna activate so that we can test our projects. And it's kind of, it's, it's gonna be that we're kind of holding it and, and it's virtual and such. But notice it says, you cannot debug this project yet because it doesn't contain any code. We can't test our code yet. We can't debug our code yet because there's no code. Okay, this is normal, like, okay. If you were to create a cutscene, do you have to code it in? Um, if you mean in terms of drawing it and such, no, we're still gonna deal with all of the usual drawing and everything that we've learned. But let's say we want a cut scene to appear after 10 seconds, we would code that. Let's say we want the timer to activate when something happens, then the animation happens, that's coding. Let's say we need to pick up three keys to then view a cut scene, that's coding. So the interactivity, we've dealt with passive projects before, now with interactive projects, It'll still mix in the drawing and animation, but now with interactivity, either actively clicking on something to play a cutscene, or after 10 seconds, play a cutscene, or after your hit points are too low, play a cutscene. So long answer, but yes and no. All right, so um, in your layers down here, let's create a brand new layer. Call this layer AS. That's short for action script. 
I would recommend we call all of our layers lowercase letters, no spaces. So let's make a new layer and call this AS, action script. You can spell it out if you want, action script. Too much typing, so I'll just type action AS. So we've been used to or review our project, some notes here. Every animated element in its own layer. We've done that all along. The background, it's on its own layer. The character's on its own layer. The fire is on its own layer. Okay, we know that. And all action script code on its own layer. So the code is going to exist on its own layer, just like the visual elements or the audio elements. Remember when we added music, we put it on its own layer. Same thing with code. We have a new layer, frame one. Go up to the window menu, and you have actions. You should call it action script or code, keyboard shortcut F9. You can also right click the frame and you have actions a little faster there. So frame one, right click actions. Get this panel that focuses on your coding. You might have to, or you might want to sort of, you know, organize yourself with this panel, put it somewhere, organize yourself somehow. And in here is where we're gonna type code. Now I'm gonna zoom in here. If you want to zoom into the to your code, you can hold control on the keyboard and on the mouse scroll wheel, you can zoom in. That's right. I want to mute your device, please. All right, so um, if you want to zoom in here, it's control plus, control minus. I'm oh, sorry, control scroll wheel. And um, we're going to type our first code here, trace. Thing is like its own language. English, Spanish, Japanese, Hebrew, Russian, Italian. It's its own language. And there's many coding languages. ActionScript, JavaScript, Java, C++. There's a brand new one that just debuted like three days ago called Finch. Brand new language of programming. And the point of programming is to, do, is to make interactivity to make something happen. Not automatically, well, it could be automatic, but usually through some interactivity. But you have to type it exactly perfectly. This will, this will remind us computers are dumb. We hear all of this about chat GPT and AI and rise of the machines and all of that. I'm not worried about that at the moment. Computers are dumb. Unless you program them to take over the world, they're not gonna take over the world. Um, so you have to type the code to make it do something and you have to type the code properly. That's why we're going to spend a lot of time in the class debugging our code, because when you follow along and write the code, you're going to say, I swear I typed it like the instructor. My code is exactly the same. It doesn't work. And then I go to help you, and then I see you, you put a period instead of a comma. Things like that, even putting a period versus a comma will break your code. If you misspell your command, it'll break your code. If you write your code out of order, it'll break your code. There's so many ways to make the code wrong. There's kind of one way to make the code right, and there's a hundred ways to make it wrong. So debugging, testing your code is gonna be very important. This first command here, it's all it's really gonna do is say a message, a message to us, the program, because the system, the computer will tell you when you did your code wrong, but it won't really tell you when you did it right. You can tell yourself when you did it right by having a trace command, a little message to myself. And we're going to see this right now. Trace and then parentheses. Okay, parentheses. This is going to be part of the language where we are going to um, have to type it the right way. In parentheses, if you look on the keyboard, you've got the number nine and the number zero on the keyboard, and you've got shift. Nine, it gives a parentheses. Uh, 
parentheses. At the end of the line, semicolon. In most sentences in English, cats. Good. You would put a period. End of sentence. But in coding, you often need some other symbol. And the symbol in ActionScript is a semicolon. So a colon is the double dot that does something else. The dot does something else. Comma. Semicolon. It's right next to the letter L. All right, this is technically a complete command. It doesn't really do anything yet. It doesn't say my message. So my message, inside the parentheses, we're going to put a quotation mark. So next to, on your keyboard, next to the enter key, you've got the apostrophe, which is the single quotation mark. And if you shift apostrophe, you get the double quotation mark. Notice it's also automatically typing for me. If I start a parenthesis, it ends the parenthesis. It needs to be a pair. If I start a quote, it ends my quote. So single apostrophe will then end its own apostrophe. And then in the quotes, we're going to do what we what has been tradition in coding in programming for decades. The very first thing we often have it have a, a, an app do is to say hello world. Keep the tradition alive. It's been around 50 years. We're going to keep doing this. So here's a command. The command is just going to say, say the message, hello world. Okay. Well, how do we see this result? Um, we're going to be used to jumping around in different parts of the app, of course. You might want to move your actions panel around and such. You might want to put it on the sidebar over here so that it opens up. Sure. What I like to do is if you double click the tab of actions, it'll sort of minimize it for a moment. You can also click the little icon on the top right, collapse it. It'll turn it into a little icon. You're often going to need to jump back and forth between viewing the visual stuff versus the code. And obviously, if you close the panel, you'll have to open it again, window, actions, or F9. Uh, close this for a moment. And now we'll go to debug, debug movie, in air, debug, launcher, mobile. Click that. Actually, uh, before that, I guess, uh, we want to also get used to saving our code. If you already clicked it, I, I think you'll be okay. But after we write some code, I would just recommend quickly control S on the keyboard. Write some code, save the code, view the code, or test the code. So our mantra will be write the code, save the code, test the code. Save the code, test the code. Okay, so the message did not pop up saying, we cannot debug your code because you have no code. We've got code now. And we've got the simulator over here. This is like simulating an Android device that is vertically at the moment like that, right here. And then on the left side, we've got various controls. But what if I were to rotate the phone around? You know, you can try clicking and dragging over here. Do it in exact dimensions over here. If we were programming it to detect when you're playing your game and then you put it like this, it would do something. When you go landscape like that, we can detect it. We can write code to detect those things. You know, we can add this stuff to our game. Let's say, you know, we have a scene in our game where we have to pour the water from the top spigot down to a certain area to unlock the door. Well, we could program it that we're going like this and like this and making the water move around and it goes into the into the into the drain. We could do that. From this left side over here, we have the section accelerometer. We also have okay, reset it, go back to normal. Okay. We have touch and gesture. Well, we don't have touch screens on these things, but a way to simulate that is we go to the touch and gesture screen and select touch layer here 
And then now we have like a little finger that we can click and tap and interact with. We didn't program in any interaction, so nothing happens. But here we can activate, simulate like I'm touching the screen, like a drag, a double tap, a, et cetera. We can simulate geolocation. We can program in that it kind of detects like, oh, I'm at the store or I'm at the park or I'm at whatever. You could program in your game that it checks your GPS and then it detects, hey, there's a Pokemon in that bush, right? So uh, it has the capability as well of geolocation. <clears throat> at the moment, none of this, we're dealing with any of these things just yet. But hey, wait, if you look down here on the bottom, hello world. If you kind of move these screens around a little bit, you're going to, it's going to be so much better if you're at home and if you have multiple screens, because on one screen you have your code, on the other screen you have your simulator. Here I'm going to have to be juggling these panels around while I do the lecture. But then at the bottom we have a tab here called output. If you, you know, you have these pop ups here, you have these apps that came up. And if you, um, you know, go between them, I go back to animate, if you also notice, it, it kind of opened itself to a different view, debug console, variables, output. And when the app, when the project loaded up, it's saying attempting to launch and connect to the player using your code. Um, this file was decompressed, loaded into memory, loaded into the simulator. And there's my trace command. The code that I wrote, the command that I wrote, hello world, is appearing there in the output. Um, this trace command is very simple, but it's very powerful because this will help you fix your code. Let's say you're writing some code to detect what time of day it is. What if your game depends on the time of day? And if it's, you know, 12 noon at the moment, in your game, it'll be daytime. And then if you start the game at 8 p.m., it can detect 8 p.m. and then your game will be in night mode. Well, the trace command and so forth is useful to write uh, messages to yourself as your code runs for you to test your code. Because it'll tell you when you did it wrong, but it won't tell you when you did it right. And one way to tell yourself when you did it right is to write trace codes, trace commands. Doesn't make sense at the moment. We'll see as we go on. Um, we have to get used to when we do this debug test movie, it switches to the debug view. It doesn't let you edit the app anymore until you stop debugging. We have a couple of ways to do this. If we go to debug and debug or Alt F12, or you can click this X over here, or you can close these panels or these pop-ups. So there's three ways, four ways to end the debug. Let's end the debug by clicking the little end over here. So the screen switches back to normal to be able to edit the app. Go back to our code. Go back to the action script layer F9 to bring back the code. Get another trace command here. Let's use new test. Just for the practice. I'm writing the trace. It's all lowercase. If you put it uppercase, that'll be an error. Actually, we should have done it uppercase to show the error. Actually, let's do that. Let's write trace with a capital T to compare it. Then the parentheses and the quotes and the semicolon. And then we will go up to debug, debug movie. There's a shortcut here. Once you tell it what you want to debug on, you don't have to go back to debug, debug movie select. You can go just quickly to debug. It'll remember the last thing you tested it on. And again, sometimes you're testing on a real device. Sometimes you're testing on a simulator, but if you, if you already have, if you already told it how you want to debug it, just go to debug, debug. Also, keyboard shortcut, control, shift, 
enter on the number pad. I'll usually be doing that. That's a nice fast way. Control shift enter. We'll do it that way too. And then I'm gonna get here. I get here what we're gonna get a lot of errors. You get a brand new panel. It didn't it didn't start up in the simulator. It will not function in the simulator unless all your code works. Well, I did this on purpose to show you. We're gonna see this compiler panel a lot. Compiler error. And this is kind of a okay, it's gonna it's gonna say a location and a description. The description often is gonna be not that helpful in terms of it's going to talk to you in a very technical way. And as a beginner, this is going to seem like gibberish. It's going to say, this is good old error message 1180, which means call to a possibly undefined method trace. What does that mean? What it's trying to tell me is you mistyped trace. It's supposed to be lowercase. Why doesn't it say you mistyped trace? It should be lowercase because computers are dumb. It doesn't know what you fully mean. I know that I want to write the trace command to make a message, and I should know that it's lowercase. There could be a command that I invent called trace with a capital letter, because programming comes with, let's say, a hundred built-in commands, but I can invent commands based on previous commands. So like the built-in commands are kind of like ingredients and I can put those ingredients together into a new command and we will often need to do that because there's no command that says add one life to my life total. But there is a command of, you know, add a one to a variable. And then there's another command that says display this graphic on the screen. So if I combine the commands of add one plus show it on the screen, I could make a command called update life total. This is gonna be uh, way more logical and technical and less artistic than we've done before. We'll still have the artistry. Now we've got to think very logically. Call to possibly undefined method. Method is another term for command. So this is saying, I don't understand the command trace. Well, of course you do, it worked a moment ago. No, a moment ago, what worked was trace lowercase. Now it's, I don't know what trace uppercase is. On the left side here, this gibberish, well, if we read it, on scene one, in your layer called AS, on frame one of that layer, on line two of your code, on column one, you know, you have first letter, second letter, third letter, fourth letter, fifth letter, first column, second column, third column, etc. It's telling you exactly where it detected the error. Go to your scene of one, go to your layer of AS, go to your frame of one, go to your line number two, and on the very first column, that's where I detected the error. This on, if I had this on line three and I tried to test my code, error, say error, the, um, it'll say error, the error is on line three. Yes, very good here. There are some very nice things added into the chat about uh, good practices for coding. Make a note of those things, those are very good. I'll explain them all so. But uh, very good points right there. So again, I'm juggling these panels around. Trace. If I misspell it like that also, it's not going to say, you misspell trace. It's going to say, I don't know what the command trace C is. Call or usage of a possibly unknown command called trace. That's how I would translate that into human words. And even if that doesn't make sense, focus on where it's telling you the error is. And also double click 
the error for it to jump exactly to where you where it's telling you the error is. Let's do some notes here. When you have code, the S layer, you can debug if you get errors in the compiler error panel. Easy answer is double click the error to have it jump you to that line of error to fix it. It's the easy answer. Just double click it, it'll take you there. You wanna read what it says. And as a beginner, as a lot of these commands are gonna be very esoteric. Like, what does that even mean? What is code, what is error 1180? Uh, we're gonna see a bunch of error types and such. And it's often gonna be about misspelling something. Did I use an uppercase? Did I use a lowercase? Did I use a period versus a comma? Did I open a parenthesis but never close the parenthesis? Are there three quotes there instead of two? Whatever the message it might say, it's telling you where to go to check it. Notice also the correct command was in blue. Correct command is not in blue. Actually, when we wrote it as a capital T was also blue, which is not correct. So even this is inconsistent. You know, Don't rely on the colors completely, but usually when the command is correct, it will turn blue. If it stays black, it's, it doesn't recognize that as a command. The capitalization there is weird. That's a special case there. If my code is correct and then I go to debug, oh, error popped up, good. The simulator popped up, good. Simulator screen popped up, the simulator editor popped up, and then the output popped up here. My message of hello world appears and my message of this is a test appears. Good. Does that, does that make sense so far? We, again, we have to lay a little bit of foundation before we do anything useful. But does that make sense? Our process here. And if we click the little X to close here, we go back to editing. Questions, comments so far? Um, we'll go back to our editor here. Let's uh, let's create. Let's go to our scene panel. We'll go to window. Let's go here to window scene. We have scene one. Let's rename our scene here to be S one lowercase. So it gave us a useful name of scene one, but that's actually going to not be helpful when we program. We want our all of the text and such within our app to be lowercase. Let's make a new scene called scene two, S2. Keep it simple for the moment. We can get more complex. We will see. But for the moment, we've got a scene one. We've got a scene two. Scene one, I drew a character. Scene two, let's draw something else. Scene one, I've got something on scene two, something else. Bug your movie. Game. Turn that off before we get a seizure. Um, see what happened. 
it played the first scene and then it played the second scene and back to the first and back to the second and back to the first over and over at lightning speed, 24 frames per second. And down on my output down there, this is a test, this is a test, this is a test, this is a test. So the default behavior seen back on part one, it plays a timeline. And then when it gets to the final frame, it jumps back to the first frame. In, in this case, it plays the timeline of scene one. Then it goes to scene two. It plays the timeline of scene two. When that ends, it goes back to scene one. And it plays that timeline. And then it loops over and over. You made your movie project. You saw that. Your, your movie animated. It got to the end. It started over. It would have been nice that the movie stopped. Yes, it would have, but that required programming. That required interactivity, which we're going to learn, of course. What's happening right now is timelines play automatically. Timelines play automatically. What's the opposite of play? If the opposite of up is down, what's the opposite of play? If we play something, if we play a project, play a play a sound, play a, a movie, play, what's the opposite of play? Not a trick question. What's the opposite of play? Stop. Exactly. Perfectly. Thank you. We need to add a command to stop the animation. So let's go to scene two. Scene two. I don't have any code here. So I can write code, and I will often write code on a scene, on another scene. I usually write the code that I need in that scene. Well, I'm talking about scenes because, hey, that's what we need for our game. We're going to be in one screen and play the game. Then we move to another screen and do something else and we move to another screen and do something else, there's going to be scenes. The various screens of the game will be scenes. And on each of those scenes, we're going to need code that is relevant to that part of the game, to that scene. So in scene two, let's make a new layer. Call it AS, action script. You can call it code if that makes more sense to you. That's fine. We're going to open up our code panel, right click actions, right stop, parentheses, semicolon. That's a very useful, simple, powerful command. Stop what's happening on screen. Stop the animation. Now, is there, if there's a stop, is there a pause? Uh, kind of. But all of the things you can imagine. Yes, you can do them in code. Some things are easier than others, but everything you can imagine for your game to do can be coded. And some might take one line, some might take three lines, some might take 300 lines. But everything that you can think of a game can do. Okay, now if I debug it. It played scene one, it's complete timeline. It went to scene two, it stopped. Right, now you know, if you have your movie, go back to your movie from part one, and you go to your final scene, and you add an actions layer, and you type the command stop, it will stop on your final scene. So that makes sense that if I add 25 frames, I have the stop command on frame one, it will stop, even though I've got 25 frames of animation. So wouldn't it make sense to put the stop where it needs to be? Do this, but I'm telling you logically. If I've got a scene, that has 25 frames and I need it to stop at the end, of course it doesn't make sense to put the stop on the first frame because it will stop. I want it to stop at the end of the animation. So of course, on a blank keyframe, I would add the code to stop 
where I needed to stop. Code needs to be added where it makes sense. So screen one, intro, then put it on scene one, you know, frame one. If after an animation, frame 30, then, you know, scene seven, frame 33, in a blank keyframe. got a layer for your code, you've got a frame for your code. Sometimes a code has to trigger at a certain point in time, put it at that point in time. Sometimes a code just needs to be always kind of running in memory. Oftentimes it'll be good to put it on frame one, like clicking a button, for example. Wherever the thing that you interact with exists, so let's say uh, on a scene with three buttons, <clears throat> so then that could be, for example, in, um, you know, scene, um, you know, scene uh, seven, ending one. <clears throat> My scene is called scene one, uh, scene seven, ending one. And then that's in uh, frame one, let's say. Go back to scene one, frame one. Notice there's a little navigator here. Instead of going through your various windows, back to scene one, you could use this left navigator over here in the actions panel. This is going to show you everywhere where code exists. Sometimes you're going to lose track of the code. Which scene did I put it in? Which frame did I put it in? This will keep track of it for you perfectly. Wherever there's code, it'll tell you there's a certain scene whatever you called it, and there's a certain frame, whatever frame it is, frame one, on whatever layer, I have a layer here called AS, and that's on frame one. On scene two, I made a layer called code, and then there's a frame 25. If my code layer were called kitty cat, it's fine, it doesn't care, I'll name these things meaningfully, but it's saying on my kitty cat layer, frame 25, there is code, and if you click, it goes there. Back on my AS layer, scene one, frame one, there's code goes there. Great. Another code. Forward slash, forward slash, space. This is a comment. Double slash. Also known as a, as a note. Double slash. Anything here is ignored. Just notes for me. There's no code here. But this is a great way to give yourself notes within your code. I'm writing notes on a separate notepad file over here, but oftentimes you want to add notes to your code. Double slash here. Single line comment. So as long as whatever this line of code is to the end of infinity, that's a comment. And notice that it is grayed out. If I were to test it, um, it's no errors should happen. It's ignoring it. It's not code. It's a comment. It's a note. I don't have those double slashes there. It thinks I want code here. And if I try to run this, it'll give me errors saying, I don't know what the command also is. I don't know what the command known is. I don't know what the command note is. I do know what the command as is. There's a command called as. That's funny. But it's saying there's an error on line whatever. Double click, there it is. So make sure you put your double slashes and make sure there's no spaces. Now these are forward slashes. Obviously backslashes are that. And the, this is not the code. Forward slashes is correct. And make sure there's no spaces in between those slashes. That's an error. Syntax error, expecting semicolon before also. What does that mean? The mistake, obviously, is do not put spaces between your double slash comment. That's 
what the error is. This is saying syntax error. You wrote it wrong. We are expecting a semicolon at the end of your command. So it thinks the command also should be ending here. It's going to still give me errors, but this is obviously not the error. The error is this. I misspelled the comment. Why doesn't it just tell me that? Computers are dumb. They don't know what you want. They are only programmed with a certain set of criteria, and anything that falls out of that criteria, it doesn't know. It's dumb. But at least it's going to tell us what line number to go to, what frame, what line, what scene, what column, right? So we got column one, two, three, four, five. Okay. This is a comment. These are comments, single line comment. You can write a comment like this at the end of the line too. Just a note. Here's a way that's kind of useful. You write some code. End of your code, you give yourself a note about what is this. You say a message. In your own words, you could explain what the code does. You know, if I go back to my scene two, stop, I could give myself a message here that says, this stops the replay loop. You could write it at the beginning before your code. I will often do it this way. This note means that the following thing or explains the following thing. I will sometimes write it this way if it's easier. If it's a short command, I might write at the end of the command my note of explaining. I could write it afterwards, whatever. I could put an arrow like that. I did shift six to make an up arrow. You can also put an emoji here, I suppose, although I never really recommend that, maybe. But if you throw in a little emoji right there. Windows, to get the emoji, you can press, uh, what is it again? I, I do it automatically nowadays. Uh, Windows period? Yeah. On, the, on a Windows computer, if you hold the Windows key and press period, it'll open up the emoji picker. You can put the emoji into your code if you want. Act it's slightly different. I have to look it up. Let's go back to scene one, and I will add a stop command. Scene one, we've got stop on scene one, we've got stop on scene two. If I debug, it does what I told it, it'll stop on scene one. I can never get to scene two now, unless I program it to move to scene two with a click. Or I program it after 10 seconds to move to scene two. Or maybe a game is happening here and my character here is catching uh, diamonds falling from the sky. And once I've caught seven of them, then go to scene two. But if I program it that I say something, go to scene two, and it goes to scene two. Yeah, the sky's the limit. Uh, some things are easier to program than others, but we can do anything with programming. So on the one hand, programming is, is difficult because you have to do it exactly perfectly. But on the other hand, programming is amazing because this is where you can do anything. You make a game, you make an advanced website, you make an app, you make, you know, anything that is interactive. All the games that you play, it's made out of code, not action script code, maybe, but other coding, other apps, other software. But it's all about logically, properly typing the code. Uh, simplifying our advanced human language to a simple computer language. Make sure we write it all right. You know, if you write stoop right there, we wrote 2 million lines of code, but then on line 1 million 1, I wrote the wrong code, the whole thing breaks. Computers are dumb. You need to write them, write the code properly. That's why when you play a game and then there's a bug and you accidentally walk through a wall, some code was wrong. That's why when you buy a game and you install it and it downloads a patch day one, because code was broken. Updates and patches and all of that, glitches and games, it's because some code was broken. 
And in a full triple E title game full of millions of lines of code with 20 people working on it, there's going to be mistakes here and there. Even though they tested everything, sometimes someone figures out on accident how to play the game wrong and then they find broken code and something weird happens in a game. It'll be the frustrating part moving forward. That's why definitely ask for help. Those of you that do the classroom home, I would definitely recommend to come in person because there's going to be the assistant here, myself here. It's going to be a lot easier to help you and we can walk to you and check your code. Instead of you struggling at midnight to figure out your code and no one's going to help you at midnight, I would recommend come to class because you can get the most help moving forward. So let's take our first break. Got some things to think about. Setting up this project, starting to write some code, testing and debugging, all that good stuff. So it's 106. We'll take a break until 116. Uh, then we'll go on. So let's say we'll move on at this point. Now, so far what the project does, there's a scene one, there's a scene two, and it stops on scene one. Well, I have scene two that I wanna go to. So what we'll do is we'll set ourselves up with some code that when you click a button, it's gonna go to scene two. This needs some setup because we need a button on the screen and then we need code that triggers that when you press the button, it goes to scene two. So that's, that's the logic of it, right? That sounds logical. There's a thing I'm gonna interact with. There's code that is kind of attached to that thing. And then the code is the interaction. So as I said, it's useful to write your own, uh, your own comments within your code here. And that's what I'm gonna do at this point. After my stop command here, just for the logic of it, I'm gonna write myself some notes. We're seeing that if we type the double slash at the beginning, you know, this is a comment. This is a single line comment. Everything at the end of the line is commented. Sometimes you're gonna to need to write a comment that's a, a chunk of a comment, and it'll be less convenient to put comment, 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 comment. It'll be better maybe if we kind of can group a comment. This is the following right here. Forward slash asterisk, which is uh, shift eight. And we can say this is a multi, multi line comment. If I write some more comment here and some more comment here and some more comment here, then I write asterisk slash. Okay, see how this little red line is connecting the two. It sees that a comment started here with this command. And then I had a notes and comments and stuff. And then at the end here, it ended the command. Because then if I write the next command here, it, it's gonna be normal. If I didn't end my comment, everything, remember everything that's gray is a comment. It won't pay attention to it, but I wanted to stop the comment. So asterisk slash, and make sure there's no space in between those or else it'll think, okay, that's not a comment, that's a code. No, we want a comment. And so what I want to do here is make myself the note of create a button on screen and then attach code to it to scene two. Button on screen that I'm gonna click on so that the code moves me to scene two. It's the logic of it. Creating the button can be done with code, but we won't get to that just yet. We'll, we'll make a plain old button as a regular drawing and then make it activated with code. So let's go back to, let's close the actions for a moment and let's go back to the actual uh, layers right here. And now that we've got, okay, we've got a layer of code and we've got a layer of drawings, uh, you want to be sure you, you know, you're, you're locking and viewing the one that makes sense. I don't want to draw on my code layer. I only want 
code to be on my code layer. So you want to lock your code layer. And then on your layer where you've got actual drawings and such, I'm gonna be very simple and draw a little circle button. A drawing of a simple circle button, give it a cool color. I click on this and then the code will trigger to take me to scene two. You're gonna do this a lot in the game. You're gonna interact with something on the screen to move to a new scene, a new part of the game, that sort of thing. So this needs a little bit of setup, as I said there in the code, uh, in the notes. Also write it over here. Where I'm also going to say, uh, button must be a symbol. Symbol instance must have a an instance name. Then code can be attached. Okay, a little bit more setup here. I need to draw a button, but then I need to turn it into a symbol, which we've seen before. Something new, this copy of the symbol needs to have a name so that the code can be attached to it. Right now, the button on screen is not anything that the code can understand yet. So we drew a button. Go ahead and select your, your button. We'll do the right click, uh, convert to symbol or F8. So after you draw that button, select it, press F8 to convert it. Seen this before, we're gonna create a name for it. There's a type, there's a registration. On the name here, uh, let's call this uh, BTN underscore um, yellow button. Whatever we want here. It, it, these names can be anything you want, but I'm usually gonna call these things a certain way to help us remember what they are. At the beginning, I put BTN. This is related to a button because I could have symbols that are buttons, symbols that are just animations, uh, symbols that are just a graphic without animation. And if you put a little prefix at the beginning here, this will say, okay, it's a button. And then some kind of name, whatever you wanna name these things. But as noted, keep it lowercase, no spaces. And instead, if you do want to differentiate the words, you can put an underscore, or maybe the dash works, but underscores are more common. Just don't put spaces, that'll be more trouble. Registration, if this thing were gonna rotate, how would we rotate it? We wanna rotate it often from the center. So this simple drawing is about to be converted into a symbol, which will be a button. It's a movie clip. I know it says button there, but ignore that for the moment. Usually we're gonna be working with types of movie clips, even if they're not animated, that's kind of weird. But even if they're not animated, we just need to turn them into a symbol so that the code can work upon the graphic. So I'll click okay. This now turns it like this, that it's a symbol in the library, library panel. I've got one item in the library, right? If you jump over to the library, I've got one item in there. And properties, if you select the um, symbol right here, and the very important part that I'm saying here in the notes, button must be a symbol, symbol must have an instance name so that then the code can be attached. Okay, that's the next step here. I've made it into a symbol. And on the properties of this object, instance name. This is saying in the library, this thing is button yellow, button yellow button. But there's no instance name. The code doesn't know it's gonna be connected to the button yet until we give this an instance name. This instance name can be anything, but let's make it make sense. Uh, for example, go to scene two. 
when you type an instance name, you want to remember to press enter. So remember everyone, no spaces, no capitalization. Keep it simple. Make it make sense. So that symbol has an instance name. So many times in the games, there's some drawing that is a symbol that has an instance name so that the code can work with it. Like, let's say I'm, I'm part of, I'm in part of the game, you have to tap the bad guy to, you know, defeat it. Well, the bad guy is going to be a symbol. The bad guy is going to have an instance name and the bad guy is going to have code related to that instance name. So very important that these have instance names. Let's go back to the code. So back to the frame one code layer, right click actions. must be a symbol, symbol must have an instance name, then code, so code. There's an instance name right here. I called go to scene two. We're gonna type the, we're gonna type the same instance name dot add event listener parentheses semicolon all right i had said earlier okay no spaces no capital letters blah 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 except for when the built-in code the built-in command is invented with capital letters there's a built-in command in action script called add event listener and it must be spelled with a capital E, capital L. No capital A here, right? It's not turning blue. And if it was all lowercase, also no blue. So you're gonna use this command over and over. You're gonna memorize where the capital letters are. So add event listener with a capital E, with capital L, it must turn blue. That's worthy of a note. Dot add event listener must be must be in capital letters. It's a built-in command. And just to pick a number, there's like a hundred built-in commands. You don't need to know them all. You don't need to be an expert in all those commands, even to make a complex game. Those are the ingredients. Every programming language gives you whatever, 100, 200, whatever, number of built-in commands. As a programmer, then we take those ingredients that are built in and combine them in different ways for the recipe to make a game, to make an app, whatever. And so there's a built-in command here, add event listener. This waits for something, which is an event. Let's write it this way. This waits, this listens. So if this cuts off, um, this waits or listens for something, an event, and then runs or does or executes more code. Add event listener. On that drawing that is on the screen, which is a symbol, which has an instance name, let us, let us add or attach some code to it. Specifically, listen for an event. Okay, again, in human languages, I could just say, when I click the button, go to scene two. But in computer languages, I have to say, there's a symbol, it's got an instance name, let's listen for an event, blah, blah, blah. This is why programming is hard. Human languages are make sense and are complex and such. And computer languages are simpler. They have their own syntax, but we're still accomplishing what we need to do, but based on the simpler computer language.
And so what this is saying is that let's listen for, let's wait for some kind of event. And events could be a click or a right click or a tap or a double tap or a pinch command on the phone or a three finger tap or a tap and drag or the event of the timer running out or the event of getting a hundred points. Events are many things. Events are something happened. So something, listen for it, run more code. Now again, computers are dumb, so we need to be a little bit more specific. As I just said, is the event a click? Is it a right click? Is it a double tap? Is it the timer ran out? Is it I got 20 points? Okay, we need to complete our code here. This is not complete yet. Next, we type here, touch, capital T, event, capital E. Okay, now we're further starting to set up to say, of the many types of events that might happen, we're gonna deal with a touch event. Oops, that reminds me, we need to do one more thing before that. We'll do that in a moment. But here we're setting ourselves up that if this were running on a device, like a simulator or a real device, we're going to be touching it. We're going to be tapping it. So we're setting ourselves up to pay attention to a touch event. And there's many types of touch events. Okay, continuing the code, dot, that is all in capital letters, touch underscore tap. Try to show my code properly right here. When do I know uppercase? When do I know lowercase? You're gonna memorize the specific times of uppercase, lowercase. All the stuff that we write, that we invent and such, keep it simple, put it all lowercase. The things that need to be a certain case, you need to memorize them, but you will memorize them because we're gonna do the same things over and over. We're gonna be tapping things over and over. So this thing, that little chunk there, you're gonna write it over and over and over and over or you're gonna copy and paste it over and over and over. And you're gonna remember that, okay, that part's gotta be all uppercase. That part's got a capital T-E. That part doesn't have an uppercase letter, but this one does. Computers are dumb. And we have to follow their rules. And here's the rules here. Right, so wait for a tap, run more code, comma, all of this is happening inside of the parentheses before the end of the command. We're listening for something to happen on the button. We're waiting for a tap, comma, run more code. All this uh, FN, lowercase, go scene two. This is a Often going to happen here, unfortunately. I'm going to get to the end of the line. I might have to zoom out a little bit. <clears throat> Here's my complete command. Get to do the setup so that it knows what are we interacting with? We're interacting with that. That is a button that we drew, that we turned into a symbol movie clip that we added a name to so that the code can listen for an event, specifically a touch event, specifically or a touch, regular touch, not a touch and drag, not a double tap, not a, a two finger tap, not a double tap, but one touch, one tap, and more code. Okay, don't do this, but if we had the command trace, hello. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Tap this, make the, make the message hello up here. But we need to do more than that. So what did I call this? I called it FN go scene two. There's no such command called FN go see, go see two, go scene two. This is where I'm gonna invent a command built on other ingredients which we will do like 99% of the time. Very rarely are we going to run just one built-in command. We're going to run like a, a, a command that we invent that's full of seven commands. 
you know, go to scene two, play a sound, update my score, remove a life, you know, group all of those commands in one command. You do that in programming 98% of the time, taking ingredients into your recipe. So next line here, press enter next line, define the new command fn go scene two. Action script doesn't know what that command means. We're going to tell it. The way we tell it is we write function and then you command or function. That's the technical term. In almost every language, again, action script is related to JavaScript. What we're writing here is very close to what you would write in JavaScript. In JavaScript on a website, there's a button that I'm going to listen for uh, an event and then open a web page. That's almost JavaScript right there. And in JavaScript, I would have to explain what does that command mean. In ActionScript, the cousin that we use in Animate, okay, let's define what this command means. Function space fn go scene two. Obviously, spell it exactly the same that you spelled it back on the previous line. If you misspell it yourself here, you know, you are now defining the definition of fn go scene, but I need to define fn go scene. Capital letter, lowercase letter. Very important that they match, of course. So if I call this lowercase f, uppercase f, that would be wrong. Lowercase f, lowercase f, that would be right. I'm inventing a command, a function. If I put it with a capital letter, perfect, capital letter. Do lowercase. Parentheses. It's a new symbol, colon, not semicolon. Colon ends the command. I'm not done with the command. I'm still adding to it, so it's a colon. Void. Explain that in a moment. Space, curly brace. Okay, next to the letter P, there's a square brace. But if you shift that, you have curly brace. You need curly braces. Curly braces are right next, right next to the letter P. Shift, curly brace. Opening and closing curly braces. Oh, the end of my command, semicolon. Hey, getting close. Um, I'm about to explain what my command means. And here's my syntax to how to explain that. Uh, it's not complete yet. Let's go back into the parentheses right here. Um, we then have to tell it again, we have all of these types of commands that we can do. I mean, these types of events on the event of a tap, a right click or whatever. So we have to further say this command will work when we tap something. So we have to say event, lowercase, colon, touch event, capital E, capital T. That matches this. Listen for a touch, run some code. The definition of this code is right here. This code will run when the event of touch happens. Again, in a human language, if I, just, if, I, if I were just to say, when you press the button, go to scene two, we have to do this just to make a button work. Yeah, that's annoying. But all programming languages are a version of this. You have to be very specific. Computers are dumb. We have to program very detailed things to happen. And if I program it wrong, if I put a capital E, even though that looks so normal and that's a blue and that seems that's going to work, that's not going to work. Why? Computers are dumb. You just have to do it exactly as it's supposed to be. There's many ways to make a mistake. There's one way to make it work. And that one letter being wrong will break your 2 million lines of code. Even though 1,000,000.999 worked, and now line 2 million doesn't work, that can break your whole app. That's annoying. 
That's the fact of the matter from programming day one when programming was invented in the 1940s, long time ago. So this is why really coming to class and getting help when your code doesn't work is going to be the best way to help you. It's going to be a little harder on Zoom because we need to see your code. For if you're here in person, we can just look over your shoulder. Oh, that's an uppercase. You need lowercase. Got it. Okay. This is just the definition of what does it mean this. Now, further, within the curly braces here, let's press enter to move it to the next line. Press enter again to move it to the next line. I want to add myself a space in between here because now I'm going to fully write the commands of what, what it means to do go scene two. Here, don't write this, but this could be like, uh, you know, play sound, and it could also be give high score, and then it could also be, what else, vibrate, 10 seconds, don't write this, but this is the purpose of us inventing a command, because this is known as an algorithm, and we're inventing the command, we're inventing the algorithm, and it's made out of ingredients, the ingredient of playing a sound, and updating the high score, and vibrating, and such. Uh, we're not doing that yet. We're not there yet. But the point is, within the curly braces, make sure, right? Make sure you put put that curly brace lower there. Press enter. Say trace. And go scene two is running. The system will tell you when you did it wrong. The system won't tell you when you did it right. Here I'm adding a command to check if I've done it right. Even before I try to actually do something, it's a good idea to test your code. At the very least, what should happen is if I try to tap on the, the button, I should get the message, this is running. This is trying to run. This will confirm that I typed this code properly and this code and this code and this code. And it'll confirm I put a comma there and not a period. And it'll confirm here that I spelled function properly and all of this, just the infrastructure. If I see that message, I have step zero. <laughs> then I can add step one, two, three, play a sound, add my high score, move me to the next level, uh, make the character animation wink at me, whatever. But if even this doesn't work, I got to fix this before I get complex. This is not complex. Yes, it's complex. You're a beginner. This is not complex when you have to make your game work. Because I'm going to click on 20 things. They're all going to be listened to. They're all going to be tapped. This is going to change here. They're all going to be a function. They're all going to be an event. They're all going to have void. This is going to be different. This is going to be different. But out of these commands here, only two things are different. Everything is going to be used over and over and over. So that's at least one thing to kind of think about. Yeah, this is complicated, but I'm going to do the same thing over and over. Sometimes for some people, the logic of that is nice that, okay, I just do this over and over. I can do that. For some people, this is so mind numbing. I'm doing the same thing over and over. Yes, but in the end result, you get an amazing game, but it's the same commands over and over with some variation. Or thing before we test our code, a comment right here at the end of the function, after the function to say, be sure to activate touch features. By default, an Adobe Animate project will work on a computer, which uses a mouse. But I want this Animate project to work on a mobile device, which doesn't have a mouse, which you tap on it, you touch it. So I have to write one command first to, to now know what it means to tap the game, be sure to activate touch features. This will be better to, so code works from line one to line one million, from top to bottom. It would be better to activate the touch feature before I try to do anything with touch and tap. You know, could write the order of the code properly. And in this case, I want to be able to tap something before I try to tap something. So let's back up a little bit, um, maybe to 
So it'd be better like one of the very, very first commands. So even though in my case, I've written 24 commands so far, 24 lines, it would be better if we go back to the very, very, very beginning. Let's go back to the top. Let's go to the very first line at the very beginning, press enter a couple of times. So let's do this. Let's go to the top and press enter just to push the code down a little bit. It would be better to first activate touch features. Before we do anything in this app, let's make the ability to be able to tap. This is a very specific command. You only type it one time and then the code will work forever. Multi-touch, capital M, lowercase t, dot, input, lowercase, mode, capital M, space equal to, multi-touch again, multi-touch, input, mode, capital I, capital M, dot, all in capital letters, touch, underscore, event, end of command. All right, so that one line, that should be one of the very first commands. It'd be the first command, which then the subsequent code is kind of based on. Then my code about tapping that button should work because we've activated the ability to tap on the screen. Before that, the app didn't know that you were going to tap onto it. But once I add that one command written in a very specific way, make sure all the spelling is exactly the same. Zoom in so you can see it more. But these capital letters where they are here, make sure they are exactly like mine. And again, I'm recording all of this. So if you were not in the habit of replaying the recordings, I would get into the habit of replaying the recordings because everything I'm doing is recorded. I'm going to put my example code on Canvas as well so that you can compare your code versus my code. That's perfectly fine. I'm going to add my notes on Canvas as well. We're going to have these lab times. Because yeah, in the beginning, this will be difficult. This will be annoying. If you don't have a mind for programming, a mind for logic, a mind for detail, this is going to be hard. But little by little, you'll get better at it. And as, I've, as I will show examples of previous semesters, everyone did the same thing you're doing in previous semesters. I've taught this class like literally a decade, and it's always the same. In the summer, we've got nine weeks to make a game. And the people that get to the end, they just practice doing this over and over. They get help, and they get some cool results. The codes have to be exactly the same, can be modified. Yes and no. They have to be exactly the same if they are a built-in code. They can be modified when we invent them. I'm inventing the code, go to scene two. So I can invent it to be typed however I want because I'm inventing it. I am defining it, I'm inventing it. But all the other code that is built in must be exactly typed exactly how it was invented. And so here, this line here is an example of built-in code. All of this needs to be typed exactly like this. But other code like, hello world, here, I can type it how I want, of course. And my own invention of go to scene, good ending. There's no such code called go to good ending. I'm inventing it. I can type it however I want. So I believe at this point we can test our code. I'm going to go up, to, uh, make sure you save. So get in the habit of writing the code, then click save. Make sure you save your code. And then let's go up to debug. I got an error, which is fine. Um, if you got an error, that's fine. Access of possibly undefined property touch event through a reference of static type class. Right, so I probably mistyped something. That's okay. But here's the point. It's saying on your scene one, on your action script layer, on your frame one, on line two, there's a problem there. So I'm going to double click it. If you got an error as well, I'm going to double click it. It's going to jump right there. So what did I mistype here? So again, I don't have this all memorized. Spoiler alert, even as a professional, you don't have to have everything memorized. You have to have nice notes. I'm checking my notes here. So what did I misspell here? 
input mode. It's sorry, it's not touch event, it's touch point zoned out there. Touch point. As we saw these things over and over, multi-touch, input mode, input mode, multi-touch, touch, whatever I wrote wrong, touch event, touch point. All right, so it did, it, it would have been great that the error said, uh, you know, you missed touch point, but computers are dumb, but it's telling me something's happening on line two. After rechecking my code, reminding myself, oh, it's touch point, save my code, debug, no error. It takes me to the, um, in here, my previous codes of hello world and test are there. If I try to interact with the button, if I try to interact with the button, well, I have to tell the simulator I am about to simulate tapping on a phone. Every time I do this debug, I have to go to the simulator window, go to the touch and gesture panel, activate the touch layer. I would then recommend click relocate. And I got the finger, tap, Ooh. scene two is running, tap. Hey, for activity, it's not going there yet. We haven't finished, but at the very least, it is detecting when I tap a button. That again, because yeah, it's a lot of setup, isn't it? There's a button I'm gonna interact with. There's a listener, listen for a tap, run my code. The definition of that code is right here. That code at the moment only says a message. In order for tap to work, at the very beginning, I have to say, activate tap. So all that is set up. Debug my project. To the simulator, touch, activate touch, relocate, tap it. Res response. If yours didn't work, of course, this is when we would give you help and so forth. Uh, we're going to pause on that for a moment. I'm going to move on for in a moment. But see, it's a lot of little bit of setup. And a lot of things have to be perfect for it to work. And this is not even doing what I need it to yet. We have all this set up, first of all. So those of you that are here in person, does anyone need a little help to make this work? Angie, you also want to help over here? Any, does this work for everyone so far? Anyone need a little bit of help to make sure this works? For those of you at home, well, you should be here. Does this work for Thank you. 
you're missing from here. Just type this final part right here. Zoom in a little bit more, perhaps. You just need that final part right there. So if this worked, this should be exciting. We're starting to create interactivity. We need a lot of setup, but we're going to do this over and over. We're going to have something on screen that is a symbol that has an instance name. The very first line of code will basically always be activate touch. And we're going to do this over and over. What is the, what is the instance name of the thing? We're always going to listen for something, a tap, and run more code. We can call this whatever we want, kitty cat. What's the definition of kitty cat? I got you right here, kitty cat. The definition of kitty cat is say a message, but then go to scene two. Okay. When I teach programming, I will almost always have us do this. We're gonna give ourselves a trace as the very first command of our new function. It's very useful to see down there on the output panel. If you see your message, all your setup has worked so far. If you don't have a trace, it won't tell you anything until you make a mistake. So I will always do that. I would always also recommend and I'm going to teach it this way. All of this brand new command is inside of the curly braces right here, of course. This can have one or one million lines of code as long as it's inside the curly braces. And the way I also teach this is I would recommend at the end of the line of that curly brace to make a comment that says end the name of your command. Go scene two, whatever I called it, I already forgot. But I would recommend to self a note at the end of that block of code, because you're going to see one little floating curly brace by itself. And again, as I said, we're going to write 450 lines of code or so. And we're going to do this over and over. Start a function, and then it ends. You're going to lose track of that final curly brace easily even though it's telling you here, the curly starts here and it ends here because of this red line. And do you notice if you click on this curly brace, it will highlight its pair. So if this were, you know, many, 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 many lines down here, you should not lose track of it because you're gonna see a red line that connects back to where it started. And if I click out here, there's, there's gonna be a line that is supposed to connect back to the beginning to help you. If you, click on the ending here, it should highlight to then show you where it started, but you're going to lose track of this. Even professionals doing this for 20 years are going to lose track of little details. Computers are dumb. One way to prevent the dumbness is like this. I wrote a comment here that when this is off all by itself like that, oh, that's a reminder that that is the ending of my command, go to scene two. Completely optional. But when I teach programming, that's one of the things I add there. And one of the things I say, add comments to your code. You know, the, these are unnecessary for the app, but who's making the app? Us people. Therefore, make yourself comments. If you're working on a team, especially, you cannot read your teammates' thoughts. You cannot guess what they mean. Put comments in your code. To scene two, this is one of these, again, that is very specific on most of the command, and then one little difference depending on what you need to do. So the thing that you're going to do over and over, movie clip, capital M, K, 
capital C, so let's type this. Movie clip. C's. Opening, closing parentheses. At the end of the line, dot, go to, lowercase, and capital A, play, capital P, parentheses, end of command. You're going to do this over and over. If you memorize where the capital letters are here, you'll be great. If you don't memorize them, that's fine. Again, I'm going to I'm recording all of this. You can pause it, replay it, make a note. Okay, the instructor at 2.01 p.m. did a thing. I'm going to make a note here that at 2.01 p.m. he did something. Let me go back to the video later and go back to 2.01. Right? All of this is being recorded. I'm going to put my example code on Canvas. You're going to be able to open my code and look at it. Yeah, you can cop copy and paste it and that's it. Sure. Or you can look at my code to fix your own code. This is the part about the uh, trust of things. I'm going to trust all of you to do your own code. I'm going to put my code example on Canvas. And yeah, I, if I never find out that you just copied my code and submitted it back to me and you got an A+, amazing, you cheated. But if you take my code as the example to add to your code, that's how you learn. That's how you get better. I want to make it as easy as possible, especially for the beginners and the non-programmers. I'm recording this. I'll give you my example code. I will put traps in my code once in a while to make sure who's cheating. But um, here, we're about to say, go to and play. Go somewhere. Move from one screen to another. You're going to do this over and over. Ending here, movie clip, let's put this between the parentheses. Uh, this dot root. I'll explain that in a moment. Just type it again. Just command, you're going to do this over and over and over, exactly like this. And then the only thing that's going to change is what goes in here. Okay, where are we going to? Where are we moving to? That's the thing that's going to change. But this command is going to be like this 99% of the time. Go to and play. Go to. Frame one. Comma of quotes scene two. Whatever the name of your scene is, in quotation marks, and whatever frame you want to go to. If on scene two, you want to go specifically to frame 99, if you want to skip a bunch of the animation and go to scene uh, frame 99, you type the number, comma, you type what scene. If I have a scene called the end. If I've got a scene called the end, That makes sense. In quotation marks, however my scene is called, jump to a certain frame number. Okay, we've got frame one on my scene two, which I called scene two, lowercase, whatever you called your scene two. That's it. There's a button that I'm going to tap on, run some code. That new code means tell me a message. Trace will only happen to us as we are coding our app. This will not be shown on screen. Well, how do you program it to make it show on screen? Of course, there's a way to do that. We'll get to that later. Tell me a message, the programmer, and then move us to scene two, frame one. Now, it is backwards. That's annoying. You have to tell it what frame, what scene. It would have been nice when they invented this command that they said what scene and then what frame, but... It has to be that it is the frame, comma, the scene. So maybe we'll say it this way. Then go to frame one of scene two. If you're writing comments. This command kind of makes sense. Go to and then play the timeline frame one of scene two. Save your work. Debug it. Got to do the dance over and over. Go to the touch. Activate touch. Relocate it. Press the button. Scene two. My output down here. 
It still says the previous stuff that I wrote. It still says the scene two is running. Make sure you created a scene. If you only have scene one, make sure you go to the scene panel and make a brand new scene two. So again, computers are dumb. If there's no scene, if I type it wrong, it won't know what to do. So in my case, it went to scene two. What I've told it is go to and play scene two. Well, on scene two, when it gets to scene two, then it gets to stop and it stops. It's code from scene one telling me to go to scene two and play that timeline. Then when the app goes to scene two, it starts to process frame one, code layer, and the first thing it sees is stop. So that's, that makes sense. If I go back to scene two, after the stop, add a trace, now add scene two. Again, it won't tell you when you do it right, but it will tell you when you do it wrong. So I'm gonna further program for it to give me a little message when I go to a scene so that I know it fully worked. If I see that message in the output, it means that code was triggered it means that I went from scene one into scene two. It started to process line one to one million. It stopped the animation. It says the message, and then it waits for more to happen. So you have to do this over and over. Touch, relocate, keep an eye out for your panel down there. Scene two is running. Now add scene two. Perfect. It made it run, it made it jump over and here, and then the message says, you're now at scene two. So, if I'm on scene two, I'm at a dead end. It's not going to animate um, back. It's not automatically going to go back to scene one because I told I gave it a stop on scene two, so it'll stop. And it's it's stuck here. So now we know to program a button to go back to scene one. So we can get the same practice here. We're going to do the same thing on scene two to go back to scene one. We're gonna put a button on the screen. We're gonna give it an instance name. We're gonna write an event listener. We're gonna write a function and then they go to and play back to scene one. The exact thing we did on scene one, we're gonna do it on scene two. Let's go to scene two. I've already drawn a button. It's in the library. on my scene two, on my layer of drawings. I'm gonna go ahead and from the library, drag a new button onto the screen. This will be a different button because I'm gonna flip it upside down. I want to change the color, I can go over to the properties of that button and go to the filters, change colors if I want. Don't worry about it for the moment. But on scene two, I'm, I'm dragging a new instance of that same button that, that I already designed. I put it on screen. This is the part that everyone's going to forget. They just think, okay, go to the code. Don't forget that after you've got an object on the screen, you then need to give it the properties of a name. By default, when you put copies of something onto the screen, it doesn't know which is which until you give it an instance name. So let's do that. We drag a copy onto the layer. That new button, we'll give it a new instance name. 
Um, I'll make a note over here. Symbols must have an instance name. Every object with instance name should have a unique instance name. If I already called one of my items button one, add event listener, the next thing to click on should be called something else. The second button to dot add event listener, whatever you want to call these things. This is the part that we invent the code, but the listener part, you see, that's exactly the same. And there's a button that says, uh, if there's a thing to interact with called evil boss alpha, fine. Call your things on screen with an instance name that is unique, but they're all going to be over and over. Add event listener. Over and over, they're all going to have the, over and over, they're all going to have the uh, touch event touch tap. Spelled in a very specific way. And then some other series of commands. Um, on this one, this one could be the same subcommand. Uh, don't worry about that just yet. But let's say this one is, you know, go to end. There's no command called go to end. I have to invent it. But I'm saying there's something I'm going to interact with. This is going to be the same over and over. And then what's the interaction? I will define it. The point here is that on scene two, make sure this has an instance name. I will just call this BTN2. These should have better names. You should have detailed names. When, you, when you're writing your code and looking at your code and something's just called button two, that's not a good name. You won't be able to tell what is this button. It's the second button, but what does it do? Back on scene one, I was more specific. I was more explicit. And I wrote that the name of that button is go to scene two. That makes sense that that's a thing that I'm going to click on to go to scene two. That's a better instance name than button two. I'm going to on purpose write a terrible name here. If you want to write a better name, you should do so. But just for the you know teaching of it all, you can call these things whatever you want. So I'm going to call that button two. I'm going to open my code. On scene two, open my code and um, the same dance about, okay, let's make that thing clickable. On my actions screen of scene two, there's a thing on screen that I called BTN2. We don't need to do that multi-touch thing. Like I said, um, you do that on the very first scene to activate touch being able to work on the whole app. You have to add it anywhere in the app, usually the very first line on, on scene one. So we don't need that. But the part about, okay, let's make that button clickable. Button two dot add event listener parentheses end of statement. The details are, this is going to be a uh, touch event. I can copy and paste it or look at my notes. Dot touch tab, just like back on scene one, comma, some code, go home. Maybe scene one is my home screen. Scene two is my first level. Scene three is the third level. And then, you know, I want to have a button to go back to the home screen, the first screen, the title screen. Go home, go to home, go, whatever you want to call these things. Go to home, whatever. I need to def I need to tell action script. I need to tell animate. What is the definition of the command go home? There's no built-in command go home. I wonder if there's a place that I can look up all the commands. Yes, of course. You can go to Canvas. There's a button there that takes you to all of the possible commands of action script. Yeah, there's like 500. You don't need to memorize them all. You're going to use the same dozen over and over. You got to memorize a dozen commands. Yeah, that's better than 500. And even myself that I've taught this class for more than a decade, and I've done web design and programming for 20 years, literally, 
I don't have every command memorized of ActionScript. I don't have every command memorized of JavaScript, two languages that I'm most adept at. You know, I consider myself a pro, but I, I don't have all of these commands memorized. I don't need to have them memorized. I need to be able to look them up. I need to have notes to get the job done, but I don't need to have everything memorized. I need to be able to click on the help so that Adobe tells me the list of all 500 commands. And then I go read the code and I say, oh, that's the command I need. Let me add it. If you're curious, click on that little help icon. There's a whole bunch of help here. And if you go to the re language reference, it'll tell you every command as well. Learn action script. Every command is there. We're going to see we're using commands again that we just used a moment ago. Function, go home, parentheses void, curly braces, end of statement. Did that back on scene one. There's an event here, lowercase colon, touch event, uppercases. It's exactly like back on the first button. See in the curly braces, a couple of enters to break those apart. Get used to then writing end notes. Just to writing a trace command just to say this is running. Not this, but this is running. The commands to move back to the other scene, same thing. Movie clip, parentheses, dot, go to and play, same thing. just has to be that we have this root. What does that mean? Don't worry about it for the moment. It just has to be this way. And then what's the different part? What's the frame number I'm going to? Probably frame one, comma. What's the scene I'm going to? The one I named scene two or scene one. If you left, if you didn't change the name, scene one. But as I said, avoid spaces. Keeping it lower case is easy to, easier to remember. When I was back on scene one, you know, we took an hour and a half to explain this. And now on scene two, I did it in two minutes or less, but it's the same idea. Something to interact with. Do more code. What's the definition of that code? It's right here. Specifically, it says a message and it moves to a new scene different scene at a specific frame number. <laughs> Wanted to go to frame 15 or 156, type frame 156. This is giving out, but we're coming to the end of the day, so that's perfect. I'm gonna test it and we'll see if it works. Turn on the touch layer again, relocate it. I'm on scene one, like before I click the button goes to scene two. I'm on scene two. There's a button waiting for me. Click on that. Back to scene one. Relatively very simple idea, but it's complicated code as a beginner, especially. But it's the same code two times that lets us move from scene to scene. This is a good introduction to code today because we had to set up a project. We had to activate the Adobe SDK over here on the help thing. We created a project file. We create, we learned about creating layers for our code. We learned about a code to give a message, a code to stop the timeline, a code to activate touch a code to work with a specific button to do a specific thing. We did it on two different scenes, same thing. Stop the scene, say a message, make a button clickable, 
Once you click the button, do a thing, the thing is go to scene one. Yay, I'm a programmer. That's right, you're a programmer. And this was just our introduction today. We're gonna to spend the whole summer, little by little, adding to the project. And we're gonna see very quickly, we're gonna to start to make this project come together via code with a, that we saw the example, scary house about, let's open the door, let's pick up the rock and hit the window. Let's find the key before the spikes get us. Let's take a multiple paths here. There's a random key, which one do I get? I need life points and hit points and XP. All of that can be done with code. All of that must be done with code. Hopefully you feel excited that we're going to move on to this phase because now we're going to make something interactive instead of passive. Yeah, you might be a little bit, um, a little bit of trepidation about, okay, this code seems complicated. I struggled today. This seems like an alien language. You're right. But little by little, it'll make more and more sense and the pieces will come together to make a game. So we're gonna wrap up in a moment. We'll do help and such. But again, moving forward, I'm recording everything. I'm putting it on Canvas. Make sure you replay the recordings. All the answers are there. I'm gonna upload my example code, this project here. I'm gonna upload it to Canvas with all my code. You can compare your code with my code. Whoops, I put a capital G on mine. That's why it never worked. But the instructor says a lowercase g and it does work. Okay, that's the correct answer. We're gonna have lab times, right? 2.30 to 3, Mondays and Wednesdays. We can try to help you online and so forth, but it is better to come in person for help. And um, be sure to pay to, uh, to the uh, tips, pay attention to the tips that the assistants give on the chat as well. And this is the tip of the iceberg that we will continue to explore as we move forward. So let's get into some lab time. Uh, to make sure it all works, to be comfortable enough. And then we'll be back next time and we'll set ourselves up for real and start to really make the game come together.